Good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to Bhagavad Gita Satsang. I'm Hari Kirtan Das, and it's an honor for me to be here with you. Uh, an honor to have you here with me. A pleasure to have uh, the opportunity to be here with you. Uh, Annie, welcome back. Uh, I'm glad you survived. I'm very happy to hear that. And uh, welcome to uh, all of you who have uh, survived Thursday. Um, or any day for that matter, whatever day you're watching this or listening. Uh, we have a little bit of housekeeping to keep uh, to uh, take care of. So for those of you who are new to the satsang, just make sure we've got all of our technical ducks in a row first. Please uh, hit the little raise your hand button if uh, you can hear me, just to let me know that that part of uh, everything is working. Very good. Thank you very much. I'm glad to know that I can be heard. And let's take care of the rest of our housekeeping chores. Uh, you do not, uh, you can adjust your audio settings and your viewing options up in the upper right hand corner. You need not worry about your microphone or video camera because I cannot see or hear you even though I know you're there. Um, I, uh, can hear you if you uh, type something into the chat, at least uh, I can sort of hear you that way. Or if you have a question, you wanna use the Q&A box, you can uh, use that if you prefer. Uh, so that is how you can be seen or heard. I will be keeping my eye on uh, the chat and Q&A boxes throughout the course of our time together this evening. Our last class. Chapter 18, The Yoga of Perfect Renunciation. We spoke about uh, Krishna's teachings on karma and how he's wrapping this up in our final chapter. We talked about how there is no way to delay that trouble coming every day, and you'll get extra credit for these classes if you can tell me where I got that from. We also spoke of the impossibility of inactivity. We covered verses 7 through 12 of the 18th chapter this evening. We will continue with chapter 18 and hear about the five factors of action. We'll talk about egoism and tunnel vision. Uh, those of you who were tuning in last week may notice that I changed this topic a little bit. Uh, I will refer you to another section of our classes uh, if you want to learn more about demonic donkeys. Uh, Arjuna's license to kill and the issue of ethics and objective reality come back at the end of our class this evening. We will cover verses 13 through 17. And before we do that, we will chant our usual invocation mantra. So for those of you who are new to transliterated Sanskrit, Sanskrit rendered in the Roman alphabet, there are marks called diacritics that give us cues as to how to pronounce each letter. The dot over an M indicates that we close our lips together as we normally would with an M, but at the same time, we also close the back of our tongue to the back of the roof of our mouth, making kind of a rounded sound that comes out of our jaw and our nose as much as out from between our lips. A bar over a vowel, in this case an A, indicates an elongated and open version of that vowel as opposed to without a bar, in which case you get a truncated and somewhat more compressed version of that same vowel. And with that, I will chant the mantra. And if you like, you can chant it back. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Translation, I offer my respects to the Supreme Person, the son of Vasudev, Krishna, who is the all-pervading transcendence. So this is a Krishna mantra, uh, also a Vishnu mantra, either way, appropriate for preceding a class on the Bhagavad Gita as 
Krishna is the speaker of Bhagavad Gita and he identifies himself as the uh, source of and none different from the Vishnu expansions and incarnations. Last week, our next to last verse, uh, verse 11, Krishna tells Arjuna to abstain from action entirely is indisputably impossible for one who is embodied. One who renounces the fruits of the action, however, is said to be a genuine renunciate. So here Krishna is responding very directly to Arjuna's disinclination to fight. He wants to take the path of inaction. And as Krishna is winding up his instructions to Arjuna and his reasons why he should actually engage in the battle he's trying to avoid, uh, he makes it clear that to not act actually is impossible, can't be done. And he has previously indicated as much. He is explaining to Arjuna and us by extension, uh, the real meaning of renunciation of action, which is to say that a renunciate is someone who does in fact engage with the world, moves through the world rather than around it or hiding from it. Uh, and that the renunciation has to do with uh, detachment from the nature of the action insofar as disinterest in uh, anything having to do with a material motivation, someone in knowledge understands the uh, uselessness, ultimately, of action that has only a material motivation attached to it, and renunciation of the results of that action or detachment from the idea of enjoying the results of one's actions, thinking them for ourselves. So next, Krishna is going to explain the constituent factors of action. And he'll do so in more detail than previously or from a slightly different angle of vision. Uh, and we will compare how Krishna described action and its component parts previously with what he's going to do in these verses coming up. So with that, uh, I will read the translation of each of the verses that we'll cover this evening, and then we'll go back and look at each verse one at a time in more detail. So, whoops, come back, come back. We're only up to this week's verses. Okay. So, beginning with verse number 13, Krishna continues, learn from me, O mighty armed one, about the five factors that the conclusive philosophy of enumeration has declared to be cause of success in all actions. Verse 14. The place of action, the actor, the different instruments of action, the various methods of action, and the fifth, the divine will of providence. Verse 15. Whatever action a human being performs by means of their body, their speech, or their mind, be it right or wrong, is caused by these five factors. Verse 16. This being so, one who foolishly thinks that oneself, of oneself, as the only cause of action due to undeveloped intelligence does not see things as they truly are. One more time, just because I thumpered that one a bit, not seeing things as they truly are. This being so, one who foolishly thinks of oneself as the only cause of action due to undeveloped intelligence does not see things as they truly are. And then, Verse 17, one whose state of being is not influenced by the belief that they alone are the cause of action, whose discernment is untainted, does not kill even when killing those who are here 
and is never bound by their actions. So that's a real mind blower of a verse to finish with. So now we will go back and look at each one of these verses in detail. And the first verse of the evening is a verse that we're going to chant together in call and response fashion. So a few more notes about the diacritics, the pronunciation cues for transliterated Sanskrit. A tilde over an N indicates uh, that you add a Y sound, a little body English to it. So the N sound becomes a Ny sound, like a piñata. We pronounce each letter that we see. So letters don't combine in this quite the same way that they do in English. So a, a A and an I together would be uh, more of a I sound as opposed to just I. The bar across the A you have already heard about. A dot under an N indicates that rather than placing our tongue right behind our teeth, we bring our tongue into the center of the roof of our mouth. So N instead of N, it's a little subtle. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. A dot under an R indicates that you'll bring your tongue back to the uh, about two thirds of the way of the roof of your mouth, er, as opposed to er, top teeth over bottom lip. And that should cover us. Uh, once again, two letters together like two consonants, to the double D, for example, means that you hit the first D, hit the brakes, and then hit the accelerator on the second D. So you're pronouncing both letters uh, rather than just mushing them together. And with that, I will chant each line of this verse. And if you like, you can chant it back. Panchaitani Mahabhaho Karanani Nibhodhame Sankhye Kritpante Proktani Siddhaye Sarvakarmanam Translation Learn from me, O mighty armed one, about the five factors that the conclusive philosophy of enumeration has declared to be the cause of success in all actions. So I'm going to back up to the Sanskrit. One of the reasons I chose this verse of the verses that we're covering this evening to chant is because of the presence of Sankhye uh, and the phrase Sankhye Kritante. Uh, Sankhye is translated several different ways depending on which edition of the Bhagavad Gita you are looking at. And Sankhya as a philosophy uh, or the philosophy of enumeration specifically, is spoken about in the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. So now we are coming full circle uh, back to this. Um, the phrase uh, krita ante, so kritante is actually a compound word, krita ante, meaning in the conclusion. So Looking at this then in some detail uh, and taking what I'm sharing with you now from uh, Madhvacharya's commentary. So Madhvacharya is one of the Acharyas or founders of uh, one of the four Vaishnava Sampradayas or lineages. Uh, so his uh, commentary on Bhagavad Gita and other Vedic texts is an authoritative part of the commentarial tradition in the Vedic system of understanding yoga wisdom texts. So 
Madhva tells us that the words Sankhya Kritante refers to the system of analysis established in the Sankhya philosophy of analytical, analytical conclusion by Kapiladev, who appeared as the son of Kardama Muni from the womb of Devahuti, uh, and who is an empowered incarnation of the Supreme Lord. Uh, his is the original Sankhya philosophy, acknowledging the existence of the Supreme Person as the goal, and is therefore in full accordance with Vedic scriptures. It should not be confused by an, uh, another imitation Sankhya philosophy by someone else known as Kapila, which bases its precepts on analysis of matter and is atheistic, not accepting the reality of the Supreme Person or the Supreme Lord, hence contrary to Vedic scriptures and as far as Madhva is concerned is unacceptable. So, uh, there are, as Madhva notes, two different conceptions of Sankhya philosophy, uh, one of which is uh, materialistic. That is to say, it's an analysis of matter with the idea that matter is its own cause and all subsequent causes are all explainable by virtue of some uh, engagement of material elements with one another. The cause of matter is matter in its finest, most subtle state. And it, therefore, it's not really substantively different from the modernist view that uh, matter organizes itself into complex stuff that somehow or other eventually manifests the uh, symptoms of consciousness. Uh, another way to understand this reference of the conclusion of Sankhya is as Vedanta. So Anta again means end, Veda means knowledge. So uh, this is also sometimes understood to refer to the authoritative Vedic scriptures, uh, or in particular, the ultimate philosophical conclusion of the Vedas, and not specifically uh, the Sankhya philosophy of Kapila. Now, just to give you a, uh, an opportunity to see what these teachings are, I am going to put some links into, well, I'm going to try and put some links into the chat window. And I'm going to show these to you on the screen for those of you who are not here uh, live and in person right this moment. Oh, there we go. Let's, well, come on, send that. doesn't want me to uh, give you this information, apparently. There we go. All right. For those of you who are not with us live, the uh, links that I just popped into the chat are these. Uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Teachings of Kapila. So this is uh, a website that I have mentioned in the past called Vedabase. And it's a complete library of writings by uh, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And this particular link will take you to two chapters in the third canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, where Kapila is teaching about the fundamental principles of material nature and how to understand those principles uh, and the interactions of material nature. So you now have that for your reference. And we will continue. If you have any questions about uh, what anything I've said so far, or uh, anything about this verse, uh, please go ahead and pop your question or comment into the chat. Um, so next up, Krishna will tell us what these five factors of action are. This now is verse 14. 
the place of action, the actor, the different instruments of action, the various methods of action, and the fifth, the divine will of providence. So, just so you've got all that, We'll go through it one at a time. All right, so here we're listing five factors of action. First of all, the place. So literally what uh, Krishna says in the Sanskrit in this verse is, he just says the place. The understanding is that the place he's talking about is the physical body. In previous verses, um, Krishna has referred to the physical body in various ways, such as the city of nine gates. Um, so some sense of, of metaphorical reference to the body has, has been there. So here, uh, the place means the place we live, the, where we live is inside these material bodies. Um, and as we speak about the influence of false ego and illusion, uh, we can remember that in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, Patanjali says specifically that our problem is rooted in mistaking the instrument of perception for the self. That is to say, we think that we are these bodies. Um, so here, right off the bat, Krishna is making this distinction. The first factor of action is the physical body. The second factor of action is the actor, the person in the body. In Sanskrit, the jiva or the atma. I will use the phrase jiva or the word jiva um, because that, as we move along, will make it a little bit easier to differentiate uh, between the second factor of action and the fifth factor of action. The third factor, the different instruments of action. This means the physical senses, the uh, instruments uh, by which we act on the world. So hands, feet, arms, legs, um, the tongue for vibrating. Uh, the mind is also considered a physical sense in that it's the reservoir of the senses. And even though it's metaphysical, it's still considered in the realm of matter. So you have the different instruments of action or the physical senses that carry out the action. Then you have the methods of action, that is the strategy and the execution of that strategy. So this originates in the mind, uh, how we think about what we're gonna do, and then we do it. So the action itself, as well as the strategy for action, uh, come together in this fourth factor that makes an action possible. And then finally, the divine will of providence. The actual word here is daivam, which uh, is related to the word deva, meaning God or divinity. So daivam means a divine force. Uh, so that's the transhuman part of this, or the, I should more accurately say the uh, transjiva part of this, because it's not just human beings that are involved in action in the material world. However, it's important to note that uh, humans, mankind, uh, and the Sanskrit word used in this verse indicates human beings, mankind, that sort of thing. Uh, we're actually responsible for our actions. A person, a jiva, who takes birth in an animal body uh, or some other kind of non-human uh, subordinate life form uh, is playing out the string of their karma. They're just obliged to act according to the laws of material nature as long as you're in that kind of body. Uh, your freedom of how you act, the extent of your free will is e more constrained than even the conditioning that we have as human beings. We are also obliged to act a certain way based on our conditioning. Uh, 
Um, we have a particular kind of body. We're born in a particular kind of society. We have a particular kind of karma. We have likes and dislikes that we didn't choose. We just, uh, that's just the way we are. But to take birth in the animal species means that freedom is constrained even further. Uh, the capacity for reflection, to wonder, how did I get like this, you know, um, simply isn't there the way it is in a human being. So according to Bhagavad Gita and other Vedic literature, uh, the human birth is a birth of responsibility. With great power comes great responsibility. Uh, and therefore, Krishna is particularly speaking here to Arjuna for the sake of wrapping up his argument about why Arjuna should fight. And Arjuna is concerned about what happens if he acts in such a way as to cause the deaths of people involved in this battle. And one of his concerns is it's bad karma to cause people to be killed. And that's what we're rolling towards here is how Krishna is addressing this objection. So he's specific here about mankind, human beings, uh, and then beyond human beings, uh, or the uh, control of human beings to the extent that they have any control at all is luck, uh, karma, fate, divine intervention, etc. cetera. Um, specifically, uh, divine forces can also be understood to mean the param atma or the super soul, the ultimate consciousness uh, as the indwelling uh, observer. So in the 15th chapter, uh, Krishna tells us that uh, he is seated in everyone's heart and from him come remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. He is uh, in the position of being the person who empowers and sanctions all of our actions. And we'll talk a little more about that as we get into the next few verses. But again, if you have any questions or comments uh, along the way, please go ahead and share those with me and I'll keep an eye on the chat in the Q&A box. Meanwhile, text number 15 once again, whatever action a human being performs, and here once again, Krishna is specific about this, um, a person, you could say a person, but a, a person could show up in any kind of body because any life form is animated by a purusha. That's uh, what makes the life form alive. Whatever action a human being performs by means of their body, their speech, or their mind, be it right or wrong, is caused by these five factors. So now this is really kind of curious in that Krishna makes a distinction between right and wrong. As far as Krishna is concerned, there is good and there is bad uh, in an objective sense. And normally we don't think like that in the modern world. We don't think in terms of objective right or wrong. We think in terms of relative right or wrong. What's right for one person is wrong for another person. Uh, what's wrong for one culture is right for another culture. Um, so we think in terms of relative morality, relative ethics. And this is a very radical proposition compared to modern thinking that there is uh, an objective metaphysical aspect of reality that tells us what is right and what is wrong or what is good or what is bad. Earlier in this chapter, Krishna spoke about prescribed action. Uh, if you look back at verses seven, eight, and nine, specifically in this chapter, uh, and when we spoke about this, we defined right work uh, or prescribed duties, prescribed action. Uh, where is it prescribed? Who's the prescriber? Uh, the, prescribe, uh, the prescription appears 
in the Vedas or in yoga wisdom texts. That is to say, uh, one aspect of yoga, Glenn, I've got your question. I'll get it to it in a second. Um, one aspect of yoga is the idea of we accept authority. It's just a question of which authority do you accept? Do you accept yourself as an authority? Do you accept a teacher as an authority? Do you accept the Bhagavad Gita as an authority? And if you accept the Bhagavad Gita as an authority, then which translation do you accept as authoritative? Which is Glenna's question. Which translation of the Gita are you using? Uh, I'm using my own translation, actually. Uh, I prepare uh, these classes by looking at about half a dozen different copies of the Bhagavad Gita, different editions of the Gita. And I put together my best translation based on authoritative source material from uh, my teachers and different editions of the Gita that I think help to illuminate the text. So if you're looking for an edition where you can uh, follow along word for word, uh, you may have to wait until uh, I publish the one I'm working on. Uh, I do have translations that I recommend and uh, if you would be kind enough to follow up with me uh, via email, uh, I will be happy to send you my recommendations of uh, half a dozen or so different editions of the Bhagavad Gita that I like and will reference. Uh, yeah, that was actually a little bit of a spoiler. So Jill, uh, thank you for noticing. Uh, you'll all be the first to know. Back to uh, the idea of an objective, you're welcome, uh, metaphysical reality. I think we can all agree that uh, torturing babies is wrong and bad, objectively bad. I mean, it's just bad. And if someone thinks that that's fun or justifiable in some way, then we will think there is something objectively wrong with them and they need some help while we uh, put them in a place where babies everywhere will be safe. Uh, this is actually a relatively old, a few hundred years worth uh, old of um, a philosophical idea that you can't derive a metaphysical fact from a physical fact. For example, uh, it's very popular to think uh, in terms of human rights. Well, what is it about being human that gives you rights? Where, where physically is there evidence that these rights should be there? You can't uh, prove that humans have rights or should have rights based on biology and physiology. Um, if you go to a crime scene and you look at all the evidence that a crime had been committed, there is nothing in the physical evidence uh, or even in the uh, theory of how the crime might have been committed that says that the crime was morally wrong. There's no reason in the physical evidence to track down, uh, apprehend, and punish the criminal. Rather, things flow the other way. From the metaphysical, you get the physical, just like the idea of an automobile comes before the manufacture of an automobile, not the other way around. You don't get an automobile and then that gives you the idea for an automobile. So Krishna is proposing that there is actually such a thing as objective right and wrong. And in order to ascertain what is right and what is wrong, there are a couple of places we can look. One is yoga wisdom texts, uh, revealed scripture. What we're looking for is not the 
specifics of a faith form, but rather universal principles of, let's call it religion, in the sense of re, again, ligio, to bind back, to reconnect uh, with the source of our being. Um, another very quick example. Uh, we in America have the Declaration of Independence, which is actually a very philosophical document with very specific technical philosophical language, such as we hold these truths to be self-evident, a philosophical term meaning requiring no further proof, uh, just because it's so obvious, um, that uh, all men, and let's break that out to mankind or all beings, if we want to be particularly progressive about it, uh, are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. Inalienable means no human agency can take those rights away, such as the King of England. Um, but not that because they're human, because you know we're not endowed with human rights based on biological fact, uh, we're endowed with rights by our creator, the source of our being. Uh, and that's why those rights are inalienable. So we have a very metaphysical proposition that explains the, our physical presence in the world, uh, and also a proposition of the self-evidence uh, of free will, of rights to self-determination uh, that are a divine right and not uh, something having to do with the nature of our mortal encasements. Uh, so a divine right to self-determination as opposed to, say, the divine right of kings. The other way that we can know what is right or wrong or good or bad has to do with the gunas, the three qualities of material nature. Krishna has been emphasizing throughout the Gita these qualities of material nature, offering them as a lens through which we can see the world as it actually is, but also uh, as a trail of breadcrumbs, a path by which we can objectively measure the elevation of consciousness with the idea that we, when we move consciousness up from ignorance through passion into the stage of goodness, our vision clears. We can actually see things as they are. And because our state of being is not tainted or clouded by selfish motive, when we attain that state of the mode of goodness, then we can be objective about reality. Or to put it another way, we can see objective reality clearly and we won't have an aversion to it if it doesn't conform to our desires because we have risen above the level where our preoccupation is with the pursuit of the fulfillment of our material desires. So we'll get a little deeper into this as we move on into the following verses and also as we get into the classes next week. Meanwhile, uh, I wanna borrow a little bit from another uh, Acharya's or teacher's commentary uh, on this verse. This time, Ramanuja, the uh, founder or uh, Acharya of the Sri Sampradaya, Ramanuja uh, says that the actions enacted by mind, speech, and body uh, that are righteous and meritorious are those that are sanctioned by Vedic scriptures. So here the commentator is confirming the idea that uh, accepting scriptural authority is the right way to understand right from wrong or righteous from uh, unrighteous. So our uh, threefold system of checks and balances in yoga philosophy is guru, shastra, sadhu. That is to say, if the teacher says it, we have to go look in shastra or scripture and see if it shows up there. And if it shows up there, we're two thirds of the way home. Then we look to sadhu or sages from the past to see if they have lived in accord with these 
teachings. And if all three line up, then we know we've got a valid teaching. If something's out of place, something's missing, then um, maybe we want to take a second look at the teaching to verify uh, if it's true or make sure we're understanding it properly, uh, etc. Okay, so uh, going back to Ramanuja, uh, that the jiva's ability to perform activities is dependent on paramatma. That is to say, remember, one of the five factors of action, the fifth factor of action is daiva, uh, divine providence, or uh, the will of the supreme person. So here, what Ramanuja is about to do is he's going to give an explanation or make an argument uh, that explains the relationship between the jiva, the individual person like you and me, and the paramatma, the supreme person, the one supreme person who is situated in every other person's heart, and how these two beings relate to each other with regard to the performance of action, because each of them is a factor. So here's uh, what Ramanuja has to say about this. Uh, the Vedanta Sutra confirms that the actions of the jiva are dependent on the Paramatma, but not influenced by the Paramatma. The Supreme Lord in his form or expansion of the super soul within the soul uh, impels the jivas according to their nature and their tendencies from previous activities. That is to say, um, gives the jiva the ability to act in response to their karma. But the Paramatma, the super soul, does not interfere with our free will in any way or invalidate any of the injunctions of Vedic scripture in any way. So one might object that if the jiva's performance of action is dependent uh, on, or is a consequence of the sanction of the Paramatma, then you don't have to worry about your karma, your reactions to past actions, because the Paramatma is doing it. But this is not a correct conception and it certainly isn't uh, in line with the teachings of Vedic literature. The correct understanding according to Ramanuja is that the Paramatma, the super soul, empowers the jiva, you and I, to act according to our free will, and hence the jiva is dependent on the Paramatma for that power, but we are the ones who get the reaction to the actions because the actions are a function of our free will, the sanction that we get, uh, unbeknownst to us most of the time, from the Paramatma, who knows all and sees all, uh, in our uh, invocation mantra, uh, the all-pervading transcendence is also omniscient, and this is, uh, therefore, a way in which the mantra is a Vishnu mantra, indicating the Paramatma. Uh, so the jiva is a secondary performer of action or actor uh, because of our free will. Uh, and we're subject to the mandatory results of our karma or the reactions to our actions. Uh, so just as if you want to move a very heavy boulder, then you require a lot of people to move it. Maybe you get five people. Um, and then you manage to move it, but the person uh, who derived the benefit from the movement of the boulder, uh, they get the benefit or the detriment. Uh, so even though five factors are involved in action, the one factor, the jiva, uh, is the beneficiary or the uh, not beneficiary, the unbeneficiary, whatever is the opposite of beneficent uh, of this action. You get either a positive or a negative result. All right, any questions about this idea of uh, the five factors of action and uh, 
the relationship between the jiva as a factor and the paramatma as a factor. Please let me know by popping something up into the chat. Meanwhile, uh, heading into the home stretch, our 16th verse of the chapter. This being so, or seeing as this is the way it is, one who foolishly thinks of oneself as the only cause of action due to undeveloped intelligence does not see things as they truly are. So here's where egoism results in tunnel vision, a lack of discernment, uh, the inability to see uh, the different factors of action and the influence uh, of the ego. The lack of discernment is specifically the inability to make a distinction between the jiva and the body, the mind and senses as well, uh, the inability to make a distinction between uh, oneself and the supreme self within. Uh, this is the influence of the false ego that blocks out the other four factors of action. So we have tunnel vision when we are under the influence of this idea that we ourselves are the cause of action. Krishna speaks of this earlier in the Gita, all the way back in the third chapter, when he says, one who is bewildered by the influence of false ego thinks, I am the doer of activities. In actuality, all activities are carried out by the three qualities of material nature. So here is where I referred to earlier, that, um, where Krishna described action as having a whole other set of factors, namely ignorance, passion, and goodness, the three qualities of material nature. And those are described as the constituent parts of action that when someone is under the influence of ahankara, the Sanskrit word for uh, the false ego, which literally means aham, I, kara, am doing. Uh, so how does this compare? We'll find out in just a moment, but first I'm gonna look at Annie's question. I am still unclear as to how much free will we actually have and how much is predetermined and how to maximize our free will. Hmm. Good question. So the amount of free will that we have is actually a lot less than we'd like to believe. Uh, it's pretty small. Um, we are constrained, first of all, by our own conditioning. Uh, we react to things in a particular way because that's the way the qualities of material nature have made us or have made what we appear to be to others and appear perhaps to be to ourselves as well. Um, how much is predetermined? Uh, we have our karma and some of it is right around the corner and there's no stopping it. We're just gonna have to go through it. Some of which, some of that karma uh, maybe it's not fully developed yet. Maybe there's still a chance that you can bend it in a different direction. Some of it is just in seed form, hasn't even taken root yet. You can pull those seeds out of the ground. You can burn them up. You can make sure that they never happen. Um, so it's really pretty nuanced that, uh, you know, we've got gradations of predetermination that we're dealing with. And it's really just a question of, how close is the karmic reaction to us in time? You know, so there are certain things that we can't change and there's a fair amount that we can change, but in order to do it, we have to rise above the qualities of material nature or at least elevate ourselves through the qualities of material nature because our actual freedom uh, increases in direct proportion to the level of the elevation of our consciousness or the purification of our consciousness. This is why the ethics of yoga are so important because the ethics of yoga are not just arbitrary rules uh, that make up someone's idea of right or wrong, but rather 
they're guidelines that allow us to purify our consciousness of the influence of the modes of passion and ignorance and rise up to the level of goodness where we get a better picture of what is reality actually and we are closer to liberation so therefore we are more liberated um, have more freedom to act uh, how so how can we minimize our karmic debt by engaging in spiritual activities that is to say what krishna is describing here in the bhagavad-gita is how to spiritualize your life not how to walk away from the world and live in the forest but how to move through the world in such a way as you're not touched by the world the same way a lotus flower is not touched by the muddy water that it's uh, growing in uh, when we spiritualize our life and we make all of our actions spiritual by virtue of making our every waking breath an offering to the Supreme Person. This is Ishvara Pranidhana in the Yoga Sutras. It is uh, become my devotee. Uh, offer your heart to me in the Bhagavad Gita. Um, when we do that, we're actually acting on the spiritual platform because that's the characteristic of our true nature, to be engaged in the transcendental loving service of the supreme person of, which, of whom we are a part. When you spiritualize your action, you don't get a karmic reaction. So it's like pulling the plug on a fan. You know, the blades of the fan are spinning around as long as it's plugged in, it keeps going and going and going. You unplug the fan, and the blades start to slow down. And as long as you don't plug the fan back in to start it up again, uh, it'll slow down and eventually stop. So, you know, you minimize, you, you minimize your karmic debts the same way you minimize your credit card debt. You stop putting charges on your card. Let me know if that analogy uh, works better than the fan. I'll bet everybody can relate to the whole credit card debt thing. Anyway, let me know if that works for you. Okay. Uh, let's go on. So three, uh, the three qualities of material nature uh, include uh, a subset. That is to say, three of the five factors of action are a subset of material nature, the body, the senses, and action itself. So remember, the place of action is the physical body made up of the, the modes of material nature. Um, the food body, Anamaya kosha, the external body, the physical body that we see, um, is made up of matter. It's just dead matter. As soon as consciousness steps away, it's just a pile of chemicals. Uh, and a pile of chemicals you really wouldn't want to be around for very long. Um, it's made of the mode of ignorance. And as you move into the different layers of the metaphysical body, the energy body, the mental, emotional body, the knowledge body, the bliss body, etc. It's finer and finer uh, elements of material nature. And you move from the mode of ignorance, unconscious, to the mode of passion and goodness, and finally to uh, the transcendental level. So the place of action, the physical body, that is made up of the qualities of material nature, the instruments of action, the senses, also qualities of material nature, the method of action, the strategy, the execution, um, also in the category of the qualities of material nature. So there's no real contradiction here. When Krishna says the activities are being carried out by uh, the modes of material nature, then that's one way of looking at action and that's totally valid. We are 
thinking we're doing things, but actually the self proper is not really involved in action at all. And the modes of material nature are carrying them out. And then in another sense, because we have free will and we are given the power by the Paramatma to act on the basis of our free will, then uh, two of these five factors uh, are actually transcendental to material nature. The jiva, who doesn't know he's transcendental usually, uh, and the divine will of providence or the supersoul who does know that he's transcendental and knows that the jiva is also transcendental and would like very much to inform the jiva uh, of that fact. Now this is where I originally had planned to talk about um, demonic donkeys, but I found that actually that wasn't uh, the best thing to do. Uh, however, I've just put in the uh, chat and I will put in the newsletter for those of you who are gonna watch after the fact, uh, that you can go back to class 39 uh, Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, verse 17 in particular, uh, to hear about uh, how egoism is for demonic donkeys. I don't want you to feel uh, left out on that. I do want to get to the last verse before our time runs out this evening, so here we go. Uh, One whose state of being is not influenced by the belief that they alone are the cause of action, whose discernment is untainted, does not kill even when killing those who are here and is never bound by their actions. So this is Arjuna's license to kill, which really kind of freaks us out usually, because now this sounds very much like uh, the argument for religious warfare, for killing people based on some religious belief, which is not what it is. Uh, in this verse, Krishna informs Arjuna that the desire not to fight is arising from his influence of his false ego. Uh, an example is that if a soldier during wartime uh, kills an enemy combatant under the command of his superior officer, then he's not going to be or she is not going to be subject to uh, criminal proceedings for having killed someone. Uh, but if that same soldier kills someone on their own personal account, then they are criminally liable for that action. So in other words, they're not, they don't have any authorization to do it. Krishna is giving Arjuna his authorization to do this. Remember, back in the 11th chapter, he told Arjuna that uh, this is already a done deal, fate accompli. I've already killed everybody on this battlefield that is due for death by virtue of the influence of time, which is another form of my very self. And you can get credit for it, or you can walk away and be the goat. And the result will be the same. The end will still be the same. It's just a question of whether uh, you have to deal with the very negative karmic reaction of walking away from your obligation to act, or whether you will get the benefit of living up to your obligation to act. Uh, Arjuna's illusion is that it's all about him, that he's the actor, that he's the one who's making it all happen, that just because I want a kingdom, all these people are going to have to die. Well, that makes me a real crummy person, doesn't it? Well, you know, that kind of low self-esteem, beating yourself up stuff, that's just another form of false ego. So this is what Krishna is telling him. It's not just about you. You have a duty, first of all, to defend righteousness. You know, you have to uh, step up and let's say, defend the constitution when it's under attack, uh, even if the outcome uh, means uh, you'll get fired. That sort of thing. It's a matter of doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And in this case, Krishna's 
assessment of objective reality, which he's in a good position to know since he's speaking from the position of God, uh, says that the enemy combatants, the people facing Arjuna, are wrong. They're objectively in the wrong. And Arjuna and his brothers on the battlefield are objectively in the moral right. And therefore, he's got a duty to step up and fight. So the actual argument is for warfare based on universal principles of objective reality, of, of an objective metaphysics of morality, not a rationalization to privilege a particular form of faith over others and to impose it on others by force. There is good, there is bad. Discernment means being able to tell the difference, and that means it's not all good. We like to say, it's all good. And Krishna says, it's not all good. What's good for you is good for someone else, uh, not good for someone else. All that's, Krishna is just not buying into any of that. And he doesn't want Arjuna to buy into it. And he's encouraging us not to buy into it. And that brings us to the end of the show for this evening. Tonight's class has been the five factors of action, egoism and tunnel vision, and Arjuna's license to kill. And we're going to come back and spend a little bit more time with this last verse, 17, from uh, tonight's class next week. Um, and I have some additional commentaries to share with you. We've kind of run, the, uh, run out of time for this evening. Uh, but I have some commentaries to share, and uh, I will uh, invite you to sit with this, maybe come up with a question or comment or two about this, because this is really where the rubber hits the road. Arjuna is being told uh, that he has a duty to fight, and our usual impulse is no fighting. We don't like fighting. Any questions? Last call for questions. Sock it to me. If you have questions after the fact, please send them to me, hari at hari-kirtana.com. Uh, this is also the place to write to me if you would like to hear about editions of the Bhagavad Gita that I uh, recommend. So, Glenna, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Next week, the Yoga of Perfect Renunciation, Chapter 18, continues with knowledge, the knowable, and the knower. We will look very specifically at knowledge according to material qualities, the gunas, the three qualities of material nature, and action, uh, wrapping up this portion of the summation of the Bhagavad Gita. We will see action according to the material qualities and speak further about this idea of how uh, knowledge and action on the higher mode of material nature is actually objectively better for everyone uh, than knowledge and action as it manifests under the influence of passion and ignorance. Annie, you're welcome so much. I want to hear more about your trip. So uh, drop me a line and let me know uh, how your big road trip went. Uh, thank you all very, very much uh, for being here this evening uh, or where, whenever you are here. Uh, I'm always thrilled to be able to spend this time with you and honored to have you here with me. I look forward to seeing you next time. Bonnie, I hope you're doing really well. Drop me a line, let me know. And I will end this meeting for all. Have a nice night.